hey guys, I'm wearing white today. And it's actually glory to Jesus Christ. Praise the trying God. Praise the Father. Praise the Son, the Lord Jesus. Praise the Holy Spirit. Forgive me victory over the flesh. And I pray he empowers me to crucify my flesh and die to my flesh, conquer my flesh by the blood of Jesus Christ. Because I've lost a lot of weight, this shirt is now super big on me. Hopefully, in Jesus' name, I continue to lose weight. I don't gain weight. Please, my God, Father, Son, Spirit, save me from that and help me to be holy and pure and righteous and love with Jesus Christ. So good to see you guys. I decided to wear white today. Now, remember, it may buffer here or there, but glory to God, the Internet connection is a thousand times better because I'm connected to the modem and I'm not using Wi-Fi so that Protestant doesn't panic. Right. Well, the weight I lose, I hope you find. Oh, my neck today I'm very stiff stiff neck you know thank you rebel you're just a rebel Ethernet Ethernet cable Ethernet la, la, la. yeah just to let you guys know this will be typically the time I'll live stream because it seems to be a perfect time for even people in Europe even though here in the US some people are still at work so God willing Lord Jesus willing right now it's 3 p.m. Central Standard Time which means it's 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 4 p.m., New York time, Canadian time. And that seems to be a perfect time for people in Europe because in Europe, some of you, it's 9 p.m., some of you 10 p.m., 11 p.m., that's still good enough. What's up, DJ next? Are you next? Right, so good time. So Lord willing, we'll try to keep it at this time un unless things come up. And I'll try to live stream, God willing, at least four times a week, no less than three times a week, because there's still things I need to do. And as if you're praying that the Holy Spirit continues to fill me with wisdom, with knowledge, with understanding, to go deeper into the word, to know the word and not just know it. Pray for me, please. I know you love me for the sake of Jesus. Pray for me that the Holy Spirit will give me power and strength and energy empower and energize me to then obey the word to live out the word the holy scriptures not just understand but to live out the word obey the word proclaim the word affirm the word and even die for the word the holy bible because that's the voice of god the voice of lord jesus christ to be a doer of his word to just be addicted to intense spiritual exercise because we're called to spiritual fitness we're called to spiritual exercise the bible Specifically, Paul likens the Christian life to exercise, you know, boxing, uh, running, right? So pray in Jesus' name that I do intense spiritual training, all of us, intense spiritual exercises, which is praying more, fasting, singing, studying the word, meditating upon the word, reciting the word, and also going out there, preaching to people and meeting their needs practically. If someone hungry, feed them. In Jesus' name, may he give me the grace to do that. Someone need, take care of them if they're sincere and not con artists. So pray for that. Pray for that. I need more of that. And always pray. Always pray. If you love me for the sake of Jesus, pray for my daughters first. My two angels. My angel is going to be 10, March 12th. Guess what I'm going to do, God willing. My oldest one is going to be 10. She's the one who made me a father. And my youngest one, my little angel, she's seven. Guess what I'm going to do? March 12, God willing, it's her birthday. I'm going to do a live stream, a short live stream, March 12, God willing, short live stream, God willing, where I'm going to say happy birthday to her and tell her and her sister how much I love them and how much you guys love them, that we're praying for them, and Jesus will watch over them and provide for them. And Lord willing, they'll be in my hands sooner than later. Amen? So March 12th, my firstborn who made me a father. Okay. With that said, we're about to begin. Hopefully pray, a little tired. I'm tired because uh, not so much physically. Hopefully in Jesus' name, I'm going to get back into working out. Just tired of a lot of new nuisances and obstacles that drain me. But Jesus Christ is our strength, my strength. He's our life, my life, our love. My love, our joy, my joy in Jesus' name, right? Does it look like I'm standing, Gabriel? Uh, Georges, do you want to get blocked again, my friend? Brother, you were not asking questions. You were being a nuisance. You were because you kept talking about the laws being added. 
be that stupid again and watch you're going to get blocked again. You see, he comes here. Georges, you kept talking about the Jews adding laws because Jesus said that and you wouldn't stop. And you gave the impression that you're even talking about some of the laws in the Old Testament were man-made, not from God. So you keep doing that. You won't last here. Right? You won't last here. So I was trying to ignore you and your distraction. And by the way, Georges, you distracted us again. And you're going to get blocked again. But before you do, why would you be talking about a topic not related to the point that I was making? Why did you come in here and disrespect everyone in the room? We're talking about Melchizedek being a picture of Christ. And you're talking about something else. So now who's being disrespectful? Not to me. Forget me. I'm nobody, guys. I'm nobody. I don't want you to respect me, per se. I want you to respect me when I'm preaching the word, to respect the word out of love for Jesus. That's all. But when I'm not speaking the word, you don't need to listen to me. Shut me up. Block me. I'm not, I'm not important. So glory to God. Let's focus. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Father, we need you. Not just when we're preaching, not just when we're teaching. We need you for life because you are life. I need you. We need you every second, every minute, every moment of our lives. Father, I am drained physically, but you are our strength. Not just my strength. You are our strength, our life, our love, our joy, our peace. Energize us, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, your beloved. Lord Jesus, energize us. Energize me by your glorious power and authority, because, Lord Jesus, you are life. All life comes from you in union with the Father and the Spirit, whether biological or spiritual life. You, Lord Jesus, are the resurrection of life. You, Lord Jesus, are the way and the truth and the life. You, Lord Jesus, give life in union with the Father and the Spirit. So grant us spiritual and physical life and energy and strength to serve you and to love you and to glorify you. Holy Spirit, we love you. We, we are in love with you. We depend on you. Energize me, Holy Spirit. I am an instrument in your glorious, holy, beautiful hands, Holy Spirit. Guide this conversation. Anoint this session. Empower your people, your servants, those who you, you've united. You have united them to become one with Jesus Christ, to become a spiritual body. And you have sealed them, sealed me, to be the body of Christ. So, Holy Spirit, we need you to teach us, guide us, instruct us. Grant me clarity of thought and speech and save me from confusion and stammering and from stumbling and causing others to stumble. And Holy Spirit, fill us with the breath of life. Fill my lungs and my chest and my throat with life to do this, the health I need to do this. And anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants, Holy Spirit. Have your way. This is your session. And give us the power not just to know the word, but to live it. Love the word and proclaim it, please, when no one's watching. And I need that grace. Crucify our flesh that Jesus will increase in us and will decrease. And Holy Spirit, seal our loved ones, my daughter. Seal them and perfect them and wash them in the blood of Jesus. And bring them to me sooner than later. In Jesus' name we ask. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' almighty name, Yahweh, Father, Son, Spirit. Yahweh, Father, Son, Spirit. Watch, woman. Hmm, interesting name. That's not Wonder Woman, right? Because we had a, oh, was there a name Wonder Woman or Wonder Warrior? I forgot, our sister in Jesus' name. Okay. Okay. Okay, it's okay. Leave him be. Kiri Eleison, he must. Kiri Eleison, he must. Sorry, we'll give him another chance. Just we'll focus here. So, guys. You remember yesterday I said something, and I need your attention, and we pray in Jesus' name. This channel explodes for the glory of Jesus and purify my heart. Pray, please, for me and all the mighty apologists like David Wood, that the Lord Jesus will save us from our flesh. All right. Yeah, I am Sheikh of all the Spirit. Yeah, I am Sheikh of all the Spirit. Yep. Sorry about that. Like I said, the buffering is much less than before. Pray it explodes, but please pray the Lord Jesus purify our motives in his precious blood, the blood of Jesus, Holy Spirit. Never allow us to prostitute ourselves for fame or fortune. Pray because we're not above the law and above reproach in Jesus' name. Have mercy on us. Now, you remember yesterday I said that Jewish tradition is all over the map. And Jewish tradition is so vast that it's hard to remember 
specific traditions about specific passages in the Old Testament <clears throat> because you have diversity of interpretations as well as conflicting contradictory traditions about specific passages. Remember that I said that yesterday? And I said, I'm, I'm hoping by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, by his power, by the power of the Holy Spirit of the living God, that I recall the information correctly and not make any mistakes. So I went back and I checked and I was correct. So glory to the Holy Spirit. Again, I'm going to remind you something. Anything and everything that is good that you do, anything and everything that is perfect and righteous in the sight of God, not in the sight of the world, is the gift of the grace of God. It's the grace of the Father, Son, and Spirit that enables you and empowers you and energizes you to do that which is good, that which is righteous, that which is pure and pleasing in His sight. What we contribute is sin, error, imperfection. So my ability to recall information and my ability to interpret correctly, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the work of the Trinity working in and through us for the glory of Jesus Christ, right? So remember that. Why will I mention that? Because I'm going to give you some links. Guys, time to now. Click on the links. Save these articles. Save these traditions. And you have my permission when it comes to my material. Let me repeat it again. My articles, my YouTube sessions, I'm giving you permission. Upload them to your YouTube channels. Upload them to your websites. Spread them. Print them out. Download them. And you even have permission to take my YouTube sessions and break them down into parts. And disseminate it for the glory of Jesus as the Holy Spirit empowers you to magnify Christ. As long as you keep the name of the title and author intact and try not to sell it like Hater Wood, who takes my materials. See, again, timing is perfect. Hater Wood, who's taken my articles, my materials, tried to pass it off as his own original research. And now he's blown up, not just financially, but as well as physically, he's blown up. Making money, living large, and we're panhandling. But we still love Haterwood nonetheless, all right? So you got you got my permission. By the way, I had to explain to someone else that David and I, we banter back and forth. Someone else took it seriously again. I don't know how many times I have to repeat on the live streams. David and I have a love-hate relationship. I hate to love him, and he loves to hate me. And we are stuck, not by choice. He's proof of predestination. God has designed and ordained that David and I will be together until we die and throughout eternity in the presence of Jesus Christ, battling Islam and false religions for the glory of Jesus till our last dying breath in Jesus' name. And so no matter how much he upsets me, I upset him. We're stuck by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus, and I'm going to carry him, even though it's left me crippled in need of a wheelchair. So now, David, send me some money because I need a wheelchair. You've left me crippled from carrying all that weight. So hopefully I don't have to explain it again because I got another email saying, man, I didn't know you and Hater would hate each other. What's going on? I thought you guys were buddies. If you want proof of predestination, David would. It is something heavenly. It's got to be ordained by God for anyone to be able to work with this guy. He is the great white dope, I mean hope, and a world-class dictator. Right? He actually justifies the black Hebrew Israelites' hatred of the white man. He's the stereotypical white man, the Edomite, the Esau, that the black Hebrew Israelites always say, see, that's the white man. That is Edomite. White man. Yeah. He's the other white meat. Okay. With well, that said. So let me give you some links. Here is a link to an article I wrote. Hold on. Here's a link to an article I wrote. How the theology of the Psalms proves that Muhammad was a false prophet. Click on it. Save it. Upload it, disseminate it for the glory of Jesus Christ. Here it is. Save the link. Save the link. Okay. Save it. We'll revisit that. Now, here is the link to the Hebrew. Now, if you can't, now this is not my website, so I can't give you authorization to download this. If you can't read Hebrew, that's okay. I'm just giving you the original Hebrew source. This is the Midrash. The Jewish explanation of the Psalms, it's Midrash Tehillim. Tehillim, that's the Hebrew word for Psalms. Tehillim, Tehillim, Tehillim. Abdul Halaj, how's my pronunciation? Midrash Tehillim, Tehill, plural Tehillim. That means the exposition of the Psalms. Okay, thank you, Abdul Halaj, Assyrian wannabe. I still love you for the sake of Jesus, though. Yeshua. 
Just click on it. I'm going to give you the English translation. This is the Jewish exposition of Psalm 1829. You'll, I'll, I'll explain to you why that's important. Even if you can't read it, it's in my article. So let me give you the link to my article again. Here it is. That Hebrew, that specific citation from this Midrash is translated in English, and it's in this article. Save the link. Now, here's another one. This one is Chabad.org. Chabad, this is an Orthodox rabbinic Jewish website that have their own English translation of the Old Testament. Now, they don't call it Old Testament. They call it Tanakh, the Tanakh, Tanakh, Torah, Ketuvim, Navim, Ketuvim or Ketuvim or, you know, and Navim. Man, I like how I pronounce the Hebrew. It's almost as bad as the way I pronounce Greek. Now, the Jews do not call the Hebrew Bible the Old Testament. They say there's nothing old about it. Save this link, folks. I mean, as long as Atur worships Jesus as their God and Savior, they will live in Jesus' name. Right? Amen. I just wanted to say that. Okay, now, click on that link. And that's why those of you Assyrians rejoice that the Lord Jesus is raising up Aturaya, Ashuraya, sons of Ashur, Aturaya, to glorify his name, to magnify his name all over the world by the power of the Spirit in Jesus' name. And I pray I'm one of them. And I'm not arrogant to think I am. Now, this link that I gave you, it's Chabad.org. They provide an English translation of the Tanakh. For those of you who are not familiar with Jude Judaism, Jews who don't believe in Jesus do not like to call the Old Testament the Old Testament. Okay, They call it the Tanakh, or they'll even call it the Torah. Torah is the Hebrew word meaning instructions. And the reason why it's called the Tanakh, let me educate you. This is the purpose of my sessions, to educate you to the best of my ability. Trust the Holy Spirit to enable me to do so, so you can learn the meat of Scripture, learn how to live the faith, love the faith, what the faith is, and proclaim it for the glory of Jesus. By the power of the Holy Spirit, using imperfect vessels like myself. That's right. Thank you. <clears throat> the word Tanakh is an acronym. It is. And what is an acronym? An acronym. Even explain that. My goodness. Is there anything in this world that doesn't need explanation? Acronym usually is a word when that each letter points to something or spells out something. Tanakh is made of three words. It's made of the word Torah. Torah is the Hebrew word, and its <clears throat> translation is instructions. Torah is the word that the Jews <clears throat> apply to the first five books of the Old Testament. The first five books of the Old Testament, what we call the Law of Moses or the Pentateuch, in Hebrew, <clears throat> those first five books are called Torah. And Torah, more accurately translated, doesn't mean law. It means instruction, instructions. Do you know why it's more accurate to call the five books of Moses the instructions of Moses, not the law? Do you know why it's more accurate to call it Torah? Anyone know? And I hope I'm not boring you because I'm trying to give you this information. I don't have an idea. Because God doesn't simply teach you by commands. He also teaches you through historical narrative and stories. And in the five books of Moses, you'll notice that Genesis, there are hardly any commands issued. It is historical narrative, stories, actual real life stories of real life people. And in their stories, God is instructing you. So it's more appropriate to call the books of Moses the instructions of Moses because God isn't simply teaching you through law, meaning do this, don't do this. He's also teaching you through historical narrative. See what happened to Joseph? Learn from his example. Learn his endurance. Learn his patience. Learn how to repay your enemies. Learn how to, see, it's all instruction. You with me there? It's all instruction. You understand? The life of Adam and Eve is meant to instruct you. The life of Cain and Abel, meant to instruct you. The story of Joseph, meant to instruct you. The story, it's all instruction. You're reading it simply as a biography. 
And it is actual history. These people actually live and experience what the Bible says they experience. But God gave you those events to teach you and instruct you because there are a lot of other events, episodes in the life of these men and women that God didn't record. The very fact that God record some of the events in the life of the patriarchs or Moses and not all meant that those particular stories and events were inspired to be part of the law in order to be used to instruct you and teach you. With me there? You understand? So Torah more accurately translates as instruction or instructions of Moses. Now, the Jews classify the Old Testament into three parts. You have the Torah of Musa, Moshe, I was about to say Musa, alayhi salam. Torah of Moshe, Moshe. Then you have what it's called the, the prophetic writings, writings of the prophets, and they call it the Ketuvim, Ketuvim, or the Ketuvim, right? And then the writings, that's the wisdom literature, like Psalms, and that's called Nevi'im, Nevi'im, Nevi'im. So it's Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim, or Ketuvim. And when you take the letters of these three words together and contract them, you get Tanakh. And you got to say that like you're spitting at someone. Tanakh. Tanakh. Now, what's beautiful about it, I'm Middle Eastern Assyrian, and we naturally like to spit in people. Man, I better stop doing that because I'm looking at myself on the screen and I'm freaking myself out. I'm about to have a heart attack. My goodness. Woo! That was scary. I have a face that even a mother has a hard time loving. Okay, with that said, the Jews who don't believe in Jesus do not like to call the Old Testament the Old Testament. They like to call it either the Hebrew Bible or they'll call all of it the Torah or the Tanakh. Okay, all this rant, and it's not wasted. I'm trying to educate you so you can be better Christians and more educated Christians for the glory of Jesus. All this rant I gave you is because the link I just posted is from Chabad.org. Chabad is a rabbinic Jewish website that provides a translation of the Tanakh in English, okay? This is their translation, and what they provide with their translation is the commentary of a renowned medieval Jewish rabbi named Rashi. Rashi is also an acronym for his more fuller name. Don't ask me what his fuller name is. I'll be here all day trying to say it. Rashi was a medieval Jewish rabbi who influenced subsequent generation of rabbis to interpret the Old Testament in a manner that differs from the rabbis that came before him. And Rasha, Rashi was an anti-Christian to the core. He tried, if he could, interpret Old Testament passages in a way that could not be used in reference to the Messiah. Even though the rabbis before him would say, this psalm is about Messiah, he tried to change that tradition in order to disarm Christians of using these prophecies about Jesus the Messiah. And he had a heavy influence on rabbis that came after him. Are you with me there? You understand how influential this particular Jewish rabbi was, a medieval rabbi, and thou shalt not pontificate gave us his name. Don't ask me to say rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki. Yitzchaki. Anyway, Yitzchak. Anyway, whole point is, this particular Jewish website not only gives you the Old Testament in English, but his commentary. Here's the link. Click on it. Remember I said yesterday that there is various Jewish traditions regarding Psalm 110.1. Some Jews will admit, yes, it is about Messiah. It's about the Messiah. But according to other Jewish rabbis, Psalm 110.1 is not about the Messiah. It's not even about David, and it's not about Solomon. Then who is the Lord of David in Psalm 110.1? Click on that link, and Rashi tells you David is talking about Abraham. Okay, here it goes. David is talking about Abraham. There you go. It's there. I'm just going to post it here, the relevant part. Can I find it? No, it's not going to fit. Okay, hold on. Here you go. Rashi says... 
Our rabbis interpret it as referring to Abraham, our father, and I shall explain it according to their words, right? The word of the Lord to Abraham, whom the world called my master, as it is written, hearken to us, my master. So did you see what he said? Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Shlomo, hey Shlomo, Rashi said, some rabbis interpret this as Abraham, that David was referring to Abraham, calling Abraham his Lord. You with me there? However, he mentioned the Midrash, a Jewish exposition of Psalm. And he says, Midrash, Psalm 110, one says, this is Abraham. What he did not tell you, what he did not tell you, and what he did not mention is the fact that the Midrash, this Midrash, Midrash, Tehillim, Tehillim, Midrash Tehillim, says that Psalm 1101 is about Messiah. So this exposition of the Psalms by other Jewish rabbis say it is about Messiah. And let me give you the quote. Okay, there you go. Let me get it for you. Here you go. This is in my article now. I'm quoting my article. Right. Okay. This particular version comes from Yalkut Shemuni, Shemuni, but the Midrash, the Midrash interprets it in reference to Mashiach. In fact, I asked the brother to translate Abdul Halaj, this particular Midrash, Psalm 1829. And he can confirm the Hebrew says, right? The Aramaic says that it is referring to Messiah at God's right hand, but Abraham complains. So here I'm going to give you that same tradition from Yokut Shemuni, Shemuni or Shemunai. Now, Abdul Haraj, am I correct? Or am I making things up? That midrash that I gave you, right? Did you not read in that midrash? That it said, Messiah's at God's right hand, and Abraham's face showed anger, right? Okay. Now, I'm going to give you that same tradition by Rabbi Yudin, Yudan, from Yalkut, Yalkut Shemuni, another Jewish source. Let's read, folks. Read with me. Here it is. This is from my article. Guys, you got to get my article and read this. Okay. Rabbi Yudan said for Rabbi Aha Bar Hanana Hananaya. Say that fast. Bar Hanana na 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 na. Aha Bar Hanana. But anyway, Rabbi Aha Bar Hananiah. In the future, the Holy One, blessed be He, will sit the King Messiah, Malach HaMashiach in Hebrew, at His right, and Abraham at His left. And Abraham's face crumbled, and he said, "The son of my son sits at the right." And I sit at the left, but the Holy One, blessed is he, reconciled him by saying, the son of your son sits at your right, and I sit at your right hand. Did you catch what this what this source is saying? Which is in the Midrash on Psalm 1829. Abraham was upset. Messiah is my descendant, and he's at your right, and God, you put me at your left? And you know what God does to appease Abraham? Abraham, think of it this way, right? You're at my left, right? Guess what, though? That means I am standing at your right, or I am sitting at your right, and Messiah is sitting at your right, because for you to be at my left side means I'm at your right side, and Messiah is at your right side. So you see how great you are, Abraham? That I myself, the Holy One, blessed be me, and Messiah are at your right hand. And Abraham was happy. Yay! You see the imagination of these rabbis? These, these rabbis had a weird imagination, right? Right? So Abraham is jealous of the Messiah. Why does he have to sit at your right hand? And I'm at your left. Thank you guys for the support. That's not fair. I'm his ancestor. He's, he, I'm greater than him. And God himself says, Abraham, look at it this way. Hold on. You're not at my left. Don't see it that way. See it that I'm at your right. I'm at your right side. And so is the Messiah. <gasps> I never thought of it that way. By golly, God himself is at my right. And is, so is the Messiah. Wow. Okay. 
<laughs> uh, you see, I'm having fun. Obviously, because this is not an actual conversation. God did not actually say to Abraham, Abraham wasn't actually upset. This is all fantasy, make-believe, mm -hmm. lies concocted by the, by the rabbis that makes even the Quran look honest and historically accurate. But what did you learn? You learned that Jews could not deny that Psalm 110 was about Messiah because there was a rich tradition, a long tradition, that said Psalm 110 is about Messiah and David is glorifying Messiah. But then some, some other rabbis, in order to combat the Christian use of Psalm 110, said, no, 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 it's about Abraham. It's about Abraham. You get it now? So save those sources, save those links, and then remind me at the end to give you another link about the Quran. So we're about to begin now if you're ready. Are we ready? Aren't you thankful, folks? Praise the triune God. First and foremost, because he's God, and as God, he's worthy of worship. Praise the triune God for not only being God and worthy of worship, but for giving you life. And praise the triune God for loving you and being in love with you. And praise the triune God for opening your hearts and minds to know the true God and know the true word. And praise the triune God for giving you this wisdom and knowledge and all this information completely free out of his love and grace that we don't deserve. Because God is the one who raises up people to pass on this information for you. I'm here because Jesus raised me up. David Wood is here because Jesus raised them up. James White, you name them, whoever they are, that are true servants of God, who worship the true God, the trying God, whom God is using in your life, God raised them up. Had it not been for Jesus, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be teaching. David Wood wouldn't be doing what he's doing. Thank the trying God for all this grace and blessing that none of us deserve. Praise him, thank him, glorify him. And the way you glorify him is not just by your words, but now live for him. God, you are worthy of my praise. I live for you as an expression. I truly do thank you and I love you, Lord. And you will be done in my life. That's the whole purpose of my sessions. Not just to educate you, to give you knowledge, to puff you up. Knowledge by the spirit to cause you to fall more passionately in love with your God who is the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Part three. You think this was exciting. You ain't seen nothing yet. Now you're going to get blown away. I've already made a thorough case, right? In the two previous sessions, Melchizedek, Melchizedek, pay attention, Melchizedek is not an actual eternal person. If you didn't listen to yesterday's session, please, because I can't repeat the stuff I already covered. That's why, glory to God, it's archived on my YouTube channel. Re-listen to part two and re-listen to part one. All the meat information is there. I explained that Melchizedek was depicted as if he were eternal because God wanted to depict him, portray him as a picture of the one who's to come. With me there? Focus, guys, on the topic. No side discussion. Thank you for your support. God bless you guys. Thank you. The Lord Jesus bless you. Right? Focus so you don't get distracted with side issues and then not benefit from these sessions. Let's look at Hebrews 7 verse 3 one more time. I'm going to real quickly show you that Melchizedek is not eternal, but he was a picture of the one who is eternal. And then we're going to go into what's called shadows, realities, types, prototypes. Prophecy by analogy, prophecy by type. Hebrews 7, 3. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, and abideth the priest, continued. And I gave you the link to the lexicon. The word is afamoyo. That's in yesterday's session. Go back, listen to it. Afamoyo means made to look like someone, made like someone, to resemble someone. What it's saying is God deliberately made Melchizedek to look like the sun, to resemble the sun as a picture of the sun. So Melchizedek is not the reality. Jesus is the reality. So Melchizedek is portrayed as if he's eternal, begin, beginningless, because he's a picture of the one who is eternal and beginningless. 
That's why if you look at the NIV, look at how the NIV renders it. New International Version. Hebrews 7, verse 3. Hebrews 7, verse 3. Thank you, Ronnie. God bless you guys. The Lord bless you for your love and your kindness. Watch here. Hebrews 7, 3. You guys are going to get blown away. Now, Protestant believer, first and last, others have been following me for years. They've already heard what I'm about to unleash on you guys. But because there are a lot of new faces, I want to introduce you to shadows and realities, types, prototypes, prophecy by analogy, prophecy by type. Because once I do that, you'll be blown away and further strengthened to have no doubt the Bible is God's word. You'll see. For most of you, you've already heard it, but it doesn't hurt to hear something over and over again until it becomes second nature by the grace of God. Now, someone posted the NIV for me. I think Protestant was going to do it before the rapture so we don't leave you behind. All right? Midrash, Tehillim, 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 Tehillim. Three ways of pronouncing it. Protestant, what happened? You left me behind? You can't leave me behind, bro. You can't leave me behind. Oh, my neck. If he doesn't have it, I'll post it. Oh, but my sin. You know, you know when I'm stressed, where I feel it? In my neck. When there's a lot on my plate, I feel all the stress on my neck. And guys, do praise the Lord and thank the Lord for these mods who do a fantastic job, especially Protestant, because these beautiful thumbnails, he's doing it free of charge. He's beatifying the YouTube cha uh, channel for the glory of Christ. And he doesn't get paid because if he's waiting for me to be paid, both him and I will be on the corner with a sign. Hey, uh, we're both homeless. I'm a homeless apologist who apologizes for doing ministry and going broke doing it. And this guy apologizes for being my friend. Can you feed us? Anyway, so Hebrews 7, verse 3. Let's read it. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God. <whistles> resembling the Son of God. He remains a priest forever. So I went in depth last night to show you that Melchizedek isn't an actual, literal, eternal person, and he isn't actually officiating as a high priest anywhere. I gave you the information yesterday. What I want you to focus on is that term, resembling. So here God is telling you, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit through this human author, Melchizedek is not an actual priest right now. He died. Melchizedek is not an eternal person. So God, why did you depict him as such? Because Melchizedek is a picture of Christ. The one that he's a picture of, Christ, he is eternal, beginningless, endless. Though he became man and died, he now raises humanity in physical body. So now even in his humanity, his humanity is deathless. And he's the priest forever. So let me prove to you that's the theology of Hebrews. Jesus is the eternal one who is uncreated, who became flesh, took on a physical body, a human nature that was created, and then raised that physical body immortal, making it deathless. Are we ready for that? Are we ready for that proof? So I can go into weightier issues, meteor issues. Let's go to Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 3. It's going to be quick because now we're going to go into some meat. Stuff, I'm going to show you how everything points to Jesus. Everything, even the historical narrative, the historical episodes, the stories in the Old Testament, the life of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the tribes and Joseph and Moses, the priesthood, the temple, and they all lived lives in such a way to point to the Lord Jesus and his ministry on earth. But Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 3, I got to unpack this, so follow with me. What's the proof? That Hebrews believes that Jesus is eternal by nature, that Jesus is uncreated, and not Melchizedek. Here you go. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. In the Old Testament, God spoke to Israel through various prophets, whom God sent revelation to the prophets in various ways. Sometimes he'd reveal something to a prophet in a dream or a vision or send an angel, maybe even the angel of the Lord who's Christ in his pre existence. Or just have the Holy Spirit inspire him. Various ways God did it. But now, verse 2. I need to do a session on what this means too. Right? 
but hath in these last days spoken to us by his son. What in the world does that mean? I may have to do a session. I'll ask you later if you want me to do a session on the implication of what it means that in the Old Testament era, God spoke to Israel through various means, various ways, raising up prophets whom he inspired through various ways, either giving them revelation in dreams or in visions or in the case of Moses showing, showing up actually in time and space or, you know, sending the Holy Spirit to speak to someone or even the angel of the Lord. But now, now he's changed that way of speaking. Now he speaks to us by his son. Things are different now. He speaks to us by his son. Now, who is the son? The son whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. This son is the one that the father employed and used to create the ages and everything in these ages. In other words, the son is co-creator. The father with the son, as well as the Holy Spirit, created the universe and everything that takes place and dwells within it. Created the heavens, even the spiritual heaven, and the angels, the universe, and everything in them, and all that takes place. Who did it? The Father with the Son. Did the Father do it alone? No. The Son with the Father did it together. Now verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. Notice, who is Jesus? Jesus is the brightness of the glory of God. The express image of God's person. And Jesus, pay attention to three, Jesus upholds all things by the word of his power, meaning his powerful word, his word that is powerful. Jesus is now sustaining all creation, all the heavens, everything in them, the entire universe, everything in them, the earth, everything in it. He is sustaining all creation by his word, giving life to all creation, guiding all creation, preserving all creation. Who's doing it? Jesus by his word. And when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Everyone got that? Do you understand what you just read in Hebrews 1? Folks, let me put it simply. This internet connection was given by the grace of Jesus. This internet connection is being sustained by the grace of Jesus. My ability to breathe right now and my heart that's pumping is the grace of Jesus sustaining me by his word. Your ability to type, your ability to see, your ability to hear and understand, that's all from Jesus who's giving you life and sustaining you by his powerful word. The birds that are flying in the sky, the insects, even the rodents, sea life, the plants, the trees, the sun that's shining, the earth that's rotating, all of that is being sustained and preserved by the all-powerful word of Jesus. Do you now know who Jesus is? See, it's not enough to read it. Understand what you're reading. Holy Spirit, help me understand what you're saying about Jesus. You caught it? Are you, are you with me there? Is it sinking in? I just want you to understand who Jesus is. What kind of power must he possess that just by his word, he is sustaining all creation, guiding all creation, preserving all cre creation, and giving life to everything? That's the power that only God possesses. That's infinite power. That, that's almighty power. You understand? That's who your Jesus, my Jesus is. But let me take it a step further. That almighty son who with the Father and the Spirit created the entire creation, everything in it, that almighty son descended into a consecrated womb of a young virgin Jewish maiden and took to himself from that womb and from her blood a physical body and a human nature. While she was a virgin, no man touched her physically and gave birth to that God-man as a virgin. And here's what's amazing. According to Hebrews 1, if you believe it, see, if you believe what you just read, 
Jesus created his mother. Jesus gave life to his mother. Jesus sustained his mother. And Jesus, with the Father and the Spirit, was creating his own physical body, his human nature, in the blessed womb of his mother, sustaining her and preserving her so she could give birth to him without dying. Jesus did that for his own mother. Are you now seeing who the Lord is? He's the only human being, because he's truly human, he's a man. He's the only human being who can look at you and say, did you know I'm older than my mother and my adoptive father, Joseph? Did you know I'm the one who created them? Did you know I'm the one who gives them life? Did you know I chose them to raise me? I chose her to be my mother, and I chose Joseph to be my adoptive father because I'm older than them. I'm older than creation. In fact, they live because of me. He's the only human being that can say that. He's the only human being who can say that. Is it sinking in who Jesus is? Now, uh, I've done an exposition of Hebrews 1 in my previous sessions. If you go back on my series on Archangel Michael not being Jesus and Hebrews, I did an exposition of Hebrews where I unpacked the meat of it. So I want to just make another point from Hebrews so you can see that what Melchizedek was a shadow of, Melchizedek wasn't the reality. He wasn't really eternal. But he was a shadow of the one who is eternal, Jesus Christ. Let's go to Hebrews 1. Let's read verses 8 to 9. I got to pack this too. But unto the son he saith, you guys understand what you're about to read. But unto the son he saith, and folks do remind me to share the links to my article on Hebrews 1. I wrote an article on Hebrews 1 and my article on Melchizedek. Is Melchizedek superior to Jesus or is he Jesus? I have two articles on Hebrews 1 and Melchizedek. Do not let me end the stream without giving you the links to those articles. Please remind me. Okay. Hebrews 1, 8 to 9. Notice what the author of Hebrews, which tradition says was Paul, says. Pay attention. Again, ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, help me not just read, but understand what I read and apply it for the glory of Jesus. Okay, watch. But unto the Son, he saith. He saith is the Father. Uh, but unto the Son, the Father says. Notice. God the Father says to the Son, and what does God the Father say to the Son? Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Did you catch what you just read? The Hebrew says that the Father is now glorifying the Son, praising the Son, and saying, Son, this is how great you are. You are the God who rules forever. And you rule with the rod of righteousness and justice. That's the father saying that about the son. And then notice what the father goes on to say about the son in verse 9. Thou hast loved righteousness. My son, you love righteousness because you are righteous. And hated iniquity. You hate evil. You hate sin. You hate lawlessness, lawlessness my son. Right? Therefore, God, even thy God, me, your father who became your God, I have anointed you with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Fellows here means his fellow brothers and sisters in faith. When it says above thy fellows, it's talking about Jesus' human brothers and sisters because Jesus is also man. It's talking about believers, you and I, part of God's human family redeemed by our brother Jesus. He goes, even though believers are your brothers and sisters, my son, because you are human like them, you became flesh and blood like them. You are above them because you're more than human. Not only are you their savior, you're also their God. Okay. Do you want me to prove to you that his fellows means not angels, but human beings? Do you want me to prove that to you? That when it says your fellow, meaning your fellow human brothers and sisters, not angels. Do you guys need proof for that? You want me to prove that to you guys? Okay, Hebrews 10, verses 9 to 15, but let's take it verse by verse. Hebrews 2, verses 9 to 11. Hebrews 2, verses 9 to 11. Okay, here it is. Who are 
Jesus's fellows. Angels? No. Human beings. Here you go. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Pay attention now. Every man. Okay. For it became him from for whom are all things, God from whom are all things, and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons unto glory, human sons and daughters to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now notice verse 11. For both he, Jesus, that sanctifieth, and they who are sanctified, both he, Jesus, who makes us holy, and we who are being made holy, are all of one. For which cause he's not ashamed to call them brethren. Now Hebrews 2. <clears throat> 12 to 13. Lord bless you too, Mike. Hebrews 2, 12 to 13. Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Now pay attention to verse 13. And again, I will put trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children whom God hath given me. With that said, now let's read 14 and 15. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Now watch. Pay attention who his fellows happen to be. Not angels. Who? Watch. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, human, he also himself likewise took, took part of the same. Since the children are human, he became human. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Do you see who his fellows happen to be? The children of God, the human family of God, men and women who are human beings by nature. Jesus then took on our humanity to be one of us, to identify with us, to save us from death and the fear of death and reconcile us to God. We are his fellows. I want it to sink in before I move in, move forward. We are his fellows. Did he, who, who didn't get this? Is, did everyone get it? You are Jesus' fellow. You are Jesus' brother. You are Jesus' sister if you believe in him. You are the human family of God the Father, and Jesus is your eldest brother. And notice it says one of the reasons, one of the reasons Jesus became flesh and blood like we are was to destroy physical death, human death, in order to destroy our fear of physical death. Guys, you understand what that means? I don't think you got it. You don't have to be afraid of dying anymore. If you get... <clears throat> The news, God forbid, may you not get this news. You got stage four cancer and got months to live. God can cure you of your cancer and extend your human life. But because of the resurrection of our brother Jesus, a flesh and blood human being like us, because of his physical bodily resurrection, where he destroyed death, rose immortal, left the tomb empty, rest assured when you physically die, that's not the end of you. You don't have to be afraid anymore. When death comes knocking, you say, welcome, because you're the door I must enter through to now <clears throat> transfer to the other side where my oldest brother waits for me with arms open and he says, welcome home. You don't have to be afraid anymore. Death has no power over you. It moves me in my spirit again. Hmm. You understand what it's saying? Hebrews is saying, Christians, trust in the Holy Spirit. Cry out to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, Jesus is alive. Give me peace. Death will not be the end of me. My brother Jesus, my Lord Jesus, conquered the grave. He's alive to destroy my fear of death. Help me, Holy Spirit. 
Exactly. Yeah. So when death comes knocking, so I'm getting moved in my spirit, guys. Honestly, I, I don't try to cry in front of people, not because I'm ashamed of crying, because, you know, there are people who have wicked motives. They'll say, look at that fake guy with the crocodile tears. The Lord sanctify my heart. But you know that mean why that's so beautiful? You know why that's so beautiful? When death comes knocking, <clears throat> you can say, I've been waiting for you because you're the door I must enter through to be with my brother, my brother Jesus, who's also my God, my Lord, my love, and my life. You understand? That's what Hebrews 2, 14, 15 tells you. One of the reasons why he became flesh like us. And he left the tomb empty. And so he's speaking to every one of you. You don't have to fear death anymore. Because I, your older brother, Jesus of Nazareth, I am the resurrection and the life. I, I am the way and the truth and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he who believes and lives shall never die. Trust in me. Believe in me. I, your older brother, have destroyed death, so you don't need to be afraid anymore. Don't be afraid. I'm alive, and because I live, you will live also. Now, I'm going to give you one testimony. And my brother here, Al D, is here. I don't know if he was in the audience that night. I used to teach a Bible study at a church in Chicago, in the suburb of Chicago, Des Plaines. And Al, do you remember, Al, do you remember Jerry Comer, that older gentleman? Jerry Comer, the older guy, white hair, used to come. Now watch this. This is a true story. Al was there. I think he was in the audience. And someone recorded that session. Someone has a recording of it. I don't know who. Anyway. He gave this story in front of everyone. It was a member of his church, a lady who was a friend of his wife. True story. Al will tell you. If he's there, he'll remember. Guys, listen to the story. Jerry Comer. There was a lady in the church whose father had just died within that month. So Jerry came up and shared the story. True story. So it's not something that happened thousand, a thousand years ago. This happened like a couple years ago, this story. So he came up and told the story. And the lady... Her father had just died. She came to church that Sunday. She was happy, and, you know, and she goes, I know you think it's weird and I'm all happy, even though my dad died. But here's the story, folks. And I hear this so often. And ask people who work in hospices to confirm what I'm about to tell you. If you work in a hospice, they'll tell you, yeah, we see this all the time. This young lady's father was a sign painter, sign painter. He went blind from the fumes and contracted cancer. You know, when you're sign painting the fumes, you get cancer and it went blind. Okay. So now the day he died, remember he's blind. He can't see with his physical eyes. According to his own daughter who was there to witness this. Guys, see? Al D, you see what he just said? Man, I remember it like yesterday. He was there in the audience. So here's another witness, two witnesses before the Lord. We're not lying. Because a lot of people say, ah, come on, man, this is baloney. All right, fine. You can believe what you want. The day he was about to die... Remember, he can't see. He says he's lying in the bed. His wife is there. Family's there, I believe. He goes, <gasps> there's Peter and John. Now, remember, he's physically blind. But he saw Peter and John. He was no longer seeing with his physical eyes. He was seeing with his spiritual eyes, his spiritual shape. He was seeing with his spiritual eyes. And the wife asked him, how do you know? Because, you know, you've never seen Peter. You know what he said to her? Guys, pay attention. He said to her. When you see them, you will know who they are. And then before he died, he looked up. <gasps> There's Jesus, and he's holding a sign saying, welcome home, and he died. Let me repeat that again. There's Jesus, and he's holding a sign saying, welcome home, and he died. Now, Al... Can you verify before the Lord, as the Lord is our witness, you heard the man tell you the story, and he heard it from the woman whose father was on who died. It's right here. See if we're lying. It's right here. He's an eyewitness. All right? And those of you, those of you who work in hospices, don't take my word for it. Ask people. See? You can see Aldi said, yes, sir. 
See, before the Lord, we're telling you we heard this. Yes, sir. As people work in hospices, when people are about to die, do they see the other side? They go, oh, yeah, all the time. So someone working in a hospice sees this. This is common, that people, the veil from the other side is removed, and they see either loved ones or angels or Jesus. They see the other side. It's more common than you think, folks. It's more common than you think. So what is Hebrews 2, 14, 15 telling you? We are Jesus' fellows, right? Because he's our brother, and he's our oldest brother, and he's infinitely greater than us. And out of his love for us, he became flesh and blood to experience physical death, to destroy physical death by his resurrection, to do, destroy our fear of death. Folks, because of Jesus, you don't need to fear physical death anymore. Folks, because of your oldest brother, Jesus, destroying the grave and physical death, and he's alive forevermore, you don't have to fear physical death anymore. You don't. And notice what Jonathan Simon just said. My wife's grandfather saw his family and loved ones. Jonathan, this happens all the time to believers. This is why after the session, fall on your face and saying, Lord, how can I ever thank you and love you enough for all you've done for me? Now, because of you, I'm not afraid of dying. Not anymore because of you. Right? Aren't you thankful? So, but not to lose the point, not to lose the point. Hebrews 1, 8 to 9, the father says to Jesus, see, life is good. I was listening to a person's testimony about his mom saying the same thing. Don't be afraid of dying. You see, the father says to Jesus, you are God who reigns forever, my son. But now notice what else the father says about Jesus. Are you ready? Are you ready? Notice what else the father says about Jesus. Hebrews 1, 10 to 12, but start with verse 10, Protestant. Just put Hebrews 1, verse 10 only, because I want to unpack this. And thou, Lord, this is the Father speaking, in the context, the Father is speaking. And he's speaking to who? The Son. So he says to the Son, and you, Lord, you, Lord, notice he called Jesus God and Lord. Wait, wait, wait. Father. You're calling Jesus God? Yes. And you're calling him Lord? Yes. You are God. You are Lord. Of course. But you're calling him God and Lord. Of course. Why? Because he's one with me. We're not the same person, but we're one God. So now the Father is honoring. The Father is glorifying. The Father is praising his Son for being God and Lord. But now let's continue reading. Okay. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. This should blow you away. You guys, I don't think you're understanding what you're reading. The Father saying to Jesus, not only are you Lord, you, my son, are the Lord that laid the foundation of the earth. You, my son, are the Lord who made the heavens by your own hands. Did you catch it? The father says to the son, my son, you are God who rules forever. My son, you are the Lord that laid the foundation of the earth. You are the Lord who made the heavens by your own hands. But notice what else the father says to the son. Hebrews 1, 11 and 12. Yes, it is Genesis 1, Alex, because it says at the beginning. That's Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning. So the father saying, you, my son, were at the beginning the very beginning Genesis 1 mentions. Now notice what else the father goes on to say about his son. They shall perish. Creation will perish. It's wearing out. It's decaying. That's why we're getting old and dying. But thou, my son, you remain. They shall wax old as doth a garment waxes old. And as a vesture, as a robe, shalt thou fold them up. You will fold them up because you're guiding creation, sustaining it. And they shall be changed, but thou art the same. You are the same, and your years shall not fall. Wow. Hold on, hold on. The Father just said to Jesus, 
at the beginning of creation, the beginning of creation mentioned Genesis 1, you were that Lord that Genesis 1 says laid the foundation of the earth. You, my son, are that Lord. And you are that Lord who made the heavens with your hands. You're the one who's now rolling them up. So they're changing. But you, unlike creation, you are the same. You remain the same. You never change and your years never end. So wait, you're telling me that God the Father just praised Jesus' son for being the eternal, uncreated, timeless, unchangeable creator, sustainer of all creation. That means Jesus' son was there before all creation. So if he's there before all creation, he is eternal. He is uncreated. And he's the one who created all creation. And he sustains all creation. And that's what the father said about the son in Hebrews 1. Okay. Now, to show you how astonishing this is, Shamir mentioned it. How astonishing this is. Let's see. What Old Testament passage is Hebrews 1, 10 to 12 citing? Psalm 102, verse 1. Psalm 102, verse 12. Let's post Psalm 102, verse 1 and verse 12. Let's show you because I got more meat. I just wanted to take care of this discussion. Melchizedek is not the eternal one. Jesus is. Melchizedek is not the eternal one. Jesus is. Okay. This psalm is a prayer to Jehovah, a prayer of the afflicted. When he is overwhelmed and poured out his complaint before Jehovah. Hear my prayer, O Jehovah, O Lord. And let my cry come unto thee. No buffering here, brother. Now notice Psalm 102, 12. But thou, O Jehovah, shall endure forever. And thy remembrance unto all generations. Okay, now, question. Psalm 1-2. Is this a prayer to a creature? Or is this a prayer to Jehovah God Almighty? In Psalm 102, verse 1, verse 12. This psalm is a prayer directed to who? A creature or Jehovah God? Yep, keep hitting that like button, folks. Jehovah God, right? Okay, now let's read Psalm 102, 25 to 27. This is a prayer to Jehovah God. Okay, now watch Psalm 102, 25 to 27. And the Jehovah Witness Bible reads the same way, by the way. Okay, watch here. Walk my neck. Whew. Psalm 102, 25 to 27. Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment. As a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy ears shall have no end. Wait, 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 wait. The psalmist is praying to Jehovah, speaking to Jehovah, glorifying Jehovah, and he says to Jehovah, at the beginning of old, you, Jehovah, laid the foundation of the earth. The heavens are the work of your hands, Jehovah. They wear out. You roll them up like a garment, but you remain the same, and your years never end, O Jehovah. So the psalmist is saying this to Jehovah, but in Hebrews 1, 10 to 12, the father took the words of this psalm about Jehovah and said it to the son. The psalmist is saying this to Jehovah, and the father is saying it to Jesus. So you have the father. Now praising Jesus and identifying Jesus as the Jehovah of Psalm 102, the Jehovah that Psalm 102 praises and glorifies and worships. And the Father is ascribing it to the Son. The Father is calling the Son Jehovah, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You got it there? So... Have we now established from the context of Hebrews? Have we now established from the context of Hebrews that Melchizedek is not the one who's eternal? Melchizedek is a, ch a shadow, a type resembling the one who's truly eternal. And who's truly eternal? The Son. It is the Son that's eternal. It's the Son that's uncreated. It's the Son that's almighty. It's the Son who created all Creation, the heavens and the earth, everything in them. It's the Son who sustains all creation, gives life to all creation. It's the Son who is truly the eternal one, who is a priest forever, not Melchizedek. Melchizedek is simply a picture of the reality. Did we make our case now?
Everyone make everyone with me. Did we make a case? I hope Marcy's listening to and Luisa. Everyone got it? All right. Let's talk about Jesus as the high priest a little more. Because the in in Hebrews, Jesus said to be the high priest. Let's look at Hebrews 3, verse 1. You ain't lying, Aldi. Joe's witnesses need to create their own Bible and forget this Bible. Even their corrupted Bible reads the same way. Amen. God bless you, brother. Sorry for the misunderstanding. I thought you were attacking the law of Moses. Okay. Now, Hebrews 3, 1. Who is Jesus? Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. So Jesus thy priest. Now, folks, this is where I'm going to... I need you to pay attention because everything points to Jesus. Write this down. We're not going to read it. Write down Numbers 28, verses 3 to 8. Numbers chapter 28, verses 3 to 8. There, Moses is commanded to tell the priests to offer the daily sacrifices, the morning and evening sacrifices. It's Numbers 28, verses 3 to 8. We're not going to quote it. You're going to have to read it on your own. There, God says the priest must offer the morning and and evening sacrifices. So every day, twice a day, the priests in the temple tabernacle had to offer the morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice. Now, when the temple was built by Solomon and the second temple, okay. So, uh, Christine Ratu, if I refute you, can you leave my page and not come back? Because I'm going to refute you right now for what you just said. Did Paul and Peter have the Old Testament? Because I think you're trying to spread your attack on Sola Scriptura and think that I, I don't understand what you're doing. You think I just I was born yesterday. I was actually born the day before. Now, Christine Ratu, let me refute you and then send you somewhere else because this channel is not for you, obviously. Did Paul and Peter have the Old Testament? Did they have the books of the Old Testament? Did they quote the books of the Old Testament? And they appealed to the books of the Old Testament <clears throat> when they were preaching. Christine, quickly, because I'm going to bounce you if you don't if you don't answer. Quickly, I'm going to count to ten. You don't answer, you're going to get blocked. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. One, send her on her merry way. Bye-bye. Because I know what this is. This is what we call an anti-sola scriptura rant. They didn't have a Bible. See, this again shows ignorance. The Old Testament was their Bible. The Old Testament, the books of the Old Testament, the books of Moses and the prophets, were there, was their Bible that they quoted from and appealed to. This is why I'm not going to tolerate idiocy. I'm not going to tolerate ignorance lies and half truth from any branch of Christianity. If you're a Protestant and you do this, I'll block you. And I block Protestants. Don't come here with your anti-rant because it only shows you're an ignoramus, you're stupid, and you don't know what you're talking about. I'm sorry. Paul and Peter didn't have the Bible. So I think when Paul was quoting Isaiah, Isaiah isn't the Bible. Or when Paul is quoting Moses, see, that wasn't the Bible. That was just something. Something. I don't know what to call it. My goodness. Anyway. And you see, she couldn't shut her mouth and benefit from the session. She was itching to try to convert, you know? Yeah, I got to refute these Protestants. I got to refute. <laughs> she started manifesting. Freddie, her argument was that you don't just follow the Bible and you need more than the Bible because Peter and Paul didn't have the Bible. And yet they had faith and they did miracles. So this is what we call an anti sola scriptura rant. And I heard it. Look, guys, when I tell you I've been listening to these debates since 2000, Protestants, Catholics, the only people I have not heard debate, honestly, I haven't heard Catholics debating Orthodox or Protestants debating Orthodox, right? Because that just, if they're there, it's very rare. It's mostly been Protestants and Catholics debating each other. And you'll find their debates either in books now on YouTube. And I've been following it. So I've heard Roman Catholics try to deny Sola Scriptura saying, look, Peter and Paul, they didn't have a Bible. 
Last time I checked, they were reading Moses. They're reading Joshua. They're reading the Psalms. They're reading Isaiah and Jeremiah. And when Jesus took the scroll of Isaiah, Jesus, that's not the Bible. What do you? And by the way, Jesus, Isaiah is three. It's Isaiah, Deuteronomy, Isaiah, and Trito Isaiah. Okay, Jesus, but that's not a Bible, and it's not one Isaiah, huh? <laughs> Come on, man. Stop with these stupid arguments already. All right. Stop with these stupid arguments. I've heard them. Look, I wasn't born yesterday. I was born the day before. Stop with these arguments. Okay. Yeah, what? Shemer, it wasn't Isaiah, you sinner. That was Isaiah 53. That's Deutero Isaiah, written after Isaiah was dead, after the Jews came back from Babylon. And besides, that's not the Bible, Shemer, Stilpet, Stilpanandi. What are you mad? Beauties. All right. No, no, no. Black Smurf, he's good. Black Smurf, man, you're quick to block people. Calm down, brother. He's a solid brother. He's a brother in Christ. All right? And you guys got to be fair with me. I'm an equal opportunist. I offend attack all major branches of Christianity, Protestants especially. So don't say, he's anti-Catholic. He's anti-Orthodox. Man, I'm anti-everyone. I'm anti-myself. I even am against myself. At least I'm fair. I'm anti-everybody, including myself. Sucker. Robert Marley. I'll smash you and Marley. Right? Rastafari. Okay, you don't like it? Take a hike, mister. Potato, potato, Abdullah, Abdullah, hello. All right. Okay, now let's put the comedy aside. Yeah, let's put the comedy aside. Brother, this is called love. When I smash your teeth in and I kick you and stomp you, that's called tough love. Spare the rod, spoil a punk like you. Have you ever read that verse? Spare the rod and spoil a punk who thinks he's being a Christian and humble. Okay. All right, now let's get back. All right. Let's focus by the grace of Jesus. You guys ready? I will crash and smash when I crash my vehicle into that light post over there and smash my head against the wall. Maybe knock some sense into me. Psst, psst, psst. You guys got to admit, man. Let's let, real quickly. In what live stream do you get, you know, what do they call it? Comedy, com comedic relief. You get satire. You get drama. You get romance. You get everything, man. Romantic movies, comedic satire. And you get it all here, buddy. All oh, save your money for that movie and come here and you'll get it all. Slapstick comedy, satire, romance, you know. You even get me singing. Unforgettable in every way. That's why, darling, it's incredible that someone unforgettable. All right. Yeah, comedy. Yeah. Tragic comedy. Are we ready now? First, last, a lot of things went on. Okay. Okay, coming back to the issue. Numbers 28, verses 3 to 8. Numbers 28, verses 3 to 8. God commands the priest to offer sacrifices every day in the tabernacle and the temple. Morning sacrifices, evening sacrifices. <clears throat> During the time of Solomon, when he built the temple... They would observe morning sacrifices, evening sac sacrifices. During the second temple, pay attention now. They would observe morning sacrifices, even evening sacrifices. Now, during the morning sacrifice and evening sacrifice, the Jews would go to the temple if they're in Jerusalem, and they would pray when the priest would offer the morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice. Follow with me here. They would pray. They would go to the temple and pray during the morning sacrifice. And go to the temple and pray during the evening sacrifice. Now, the Bible and extra biblical sources tell us that the time of the morning sacrifice, pay attention, the time of the morning sacrifice was 9 a.m. Sixth hour, I'm sorry, the third hour, my, my bad, the third hour from Jewish reckoning, which is 9 a.m. 
The time of the evening sacrifice was 3 p.m., the ninth hour, according to Jewish reckoning. So at 9 a.m., the third hour, that's what the Jews called it at that time. And then 3 p.m., the ninth hour, 3 p.m., was the time of the evening sacrifice. Are you with me so far? So at 9 a.m., the third hour, the, the priests would offer sacrifice and the Jews would go pray in the temple. 3 p.m., ninth hour, the priests would offer the evening sacrifice and the Jews would go and pray. You got that? Now let me prove that to you from the Bible. You can definitely prove that 3 p.m., ninth hour, the Jews went up to the temple and prayed. Acts 3, verse 1. So yeah, yeah, many of you have heard this because I've mentioned this over the years. But for the benefit of those who haven't heard it, guys, this is the benefit for those of you hearing it for the first time. Most of you have been following me for more than a year. You've heard this. Okay, Acts 3, verse 1. Now, Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. So why did they go to the temple? It was the time of prayer, the ninth hour, which in our time was 3 p.m. That's why if you post the NIV, first last, post the NIV, it says 3 p.m. For those of you who understand what the ninth hour is. Now, do we have any proof from the Bible itself that 9 a.m., the third hour was the time of the morning prayer and sacrifice? Yes, you find it in Acts 2, 14 and 15. It's not direct, it's indirect. Acts 2, 14 and 15. Okay. Acts 2, 14 and 15. And first last, if you can post the NIV, I'd appreciate it. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice. And said unto them, ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. Now notice, for these are not drunken. They're not drunk, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. So a group of Jews are gathered at the temple. It's the third hour of the day, nine in the morning, and that's when the miracle of speaking in tongues take place. Why were they there at nine in the morning? which is the third hour. See NIV? One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, three in the afternoon, right? And then Acts 2, 14, 15, I'll tell you, nine in the morning. Because that was the time of the morning prayer sacrifice. That was the time of the evening prayer and sacrifice. Did you, everyone got it? Morning sacrifice, morning prayer, 9 a.m. Evening sacrifice, evening prayer, 3 p.m. Third hour, ninth hour. Everyone got it? That's when the priest would sacrifice and pray and the people would join them. Remember, Jesus is our high priest. Mark 15, 25. Mark 15, 25. Mark 15, 25. And it was the third hour and they crucified him. Coincidence? Jesus, our sacrifice and high priest, is crucified at the time of the morning sacrifice, third hour, 9 a.m. And then Luke 23, 33 to 34. Watch what he does at the time of his crucifixion was the time of the morning sacrifice and prayer. Luke 23, 33 to 34. Watch. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors. Remember, he was crucified at the third hour, 9 a.m., one on the right hand and the other on the, uh, on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, and they part his raiment and cast lots. So Jesus, our high priest, mediator, intercessor, and our sacrifice, crucified at the time of morning sacrifice and prayer, 9 a.m., and as he's crucified, he then prays for those who are crucifying him, doing what the priest does, praying as he offers God a sacrifice at the morning hour of sacrifice and prayer. Send this guy on his way. Send him to the Viking tribe. Maybe they can then slaughter him for, for the Norse gods. This guy, Victor. You with me there? 
Now watch what Jesus also does. Mark 15, 34. Mark 15, 34 and Matthew 27, 46. Mark 15, 34 and Matthew 27, 46. And at the ninth hour, ninth hour, the time of the evening sacrifice and prayer, the very hour that Peter and James went to the temple to pray, three in the afternoon. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, praying again in the words of Psalm 22, verse 1, saying, Eloi, Eloi, ili ili lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Matthew 27, 46, the parallel. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Iri, Iri, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So you want me to believe it's a coincidence. Jesus, our high priest and our sacrifice, was crucified at the morning hour of sacrifice and prayer. And when he was crucified, he then prayed for the forgiveness of those who were crucifying him. And then at the ninth hour, which is the time of the evening sacrifice and prayer, he then cries out in the words of Psalm 22. And that's a coincidence, huh? You know what's amazing, though? Neither Mark nor Matthew nor Luke make the connection for you. They just write these as simple historical facts, which they were. They're just giving you the facts of history. They're just saying this is what happened. But they don't explain the significance of these historical facts. That's left for the reader, guided by the Holy Spirit, to discover these facts that are there for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, how this Bible is supernatural from beginning to end. Sink in or no? Everyone with me there? Sink in? So what I'm going to do in the next session, God willing, and I'll give you a taste today. I'll give you a taste today. And Aldi and Protestant and First Last, they've already heard this because I've, I've taught this in the previous sessions over the previous years. But again, because there are new faces that sometimes are not able to find these sessions because they're archived or the articles, it bears repeating, even for those who already heard this, because the more we hear something, it becomes second nature. We can recall it, absorb it, and share it by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Christ. Now, let me show you how the Bible is written to point to Jesus, and not just prophecies where it says, in the future, a ruler will come. In the future, in this place, you know, a Savior will come. Both the Jews at the time of Jesus... And Jesus and his followers themselves saw the old all, entire Old Testament, entire Old Testament, not just the prophecies, but the historical events, the historical narratives, all of that as containing hints of future events, of things to come. In other words, life, the life of Abraham pointed to greater spiritual realities to come. Jacob's experience pointed to greater spiritual realities to come. All of it was designed to point to a greater spiritual reality, and that greater spiritual reality is Jesus. You with me there? All of it. Abraham's story. Isaac's story. Jacob's story. Joseph's story. Moses' story. All these major characters and their lives were designed. These are true historical facts, I'm saying these are real historical events. But these historical events were guided by God in such a way to point to a greater event, the coming of Christ and his work and the birth of his church, his spiritual body. Okay. Number one. Now, those of you already know this, those of you who have already heard this, don't answer the question. I'm trying to give the newbies a chance. The, the word church itself, the word church, is that something that Jesus came up with for the first time when he showed up on earth? Or is that term church something that points to a reality that was already occurring in the Old Testament? In other words, when did the church begin? Did it begin with the coming of Christ? 
or was the church already in existence before Christ? Now, those of you following me, you should know the answer to this. So don't answer if you know it. I'm trying to give the newbies a chance because a lot of people think the term church is something that was invented for the first time, right, when Jesus showed up. No. Did you know they've been having church all the way back at least at the time of Moses? Let me prove it to you. Your English translations, I don't want to say Rob, that's too strong, but your English translations, because of the way they translate these terms, hide the fact that the church has been in existence all the way back at least to the time of Exodus. You want proof? Acts 7, 38. Louisa, if they taught you that, that's wrong. Acts 7, 38, speaking of Moses. Speaking of Moses and the Exodus. Speaking of Moses and Israel in the wilderness. Acts 7, 38. The King James gets it. This is he that was in the church. Bam. Moses was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spoke to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. Did you catch it? They're already having church at the time of Moses in the wilderness at Mount Sinai when the God had appeared to Moses in Israel. The word here is ecclesia, ecclesia, where we get ecclesiology. This is the Greek word used to translate a Hebrew word. Now, Abdul Halaj will confirm this. Yep, Jonathan, I know he's excited, right? And he wants to show me, yes, see, I know it too, brother. Praise God, you know, and I pray increases your faith and your knowledge. The word ekklesia is the Greek translation of a, of a Hebrew word, kahel. Kahel. This Hebrew word, kahel, means congregation or assembly. And oftentimes in the Old Testament, it's called kahel Yahovah. Kahel Elohim, Kahel Il. It's the assembly, the congregation of God, the assembly, the congregation of Jehovah. When the Old Testament was translated into Greek, that word Kahel was translated Ekklesia. Ekklesia is the Greek word from which you get church. So they've been having church all throughout the Old Testament. Okay? But here's where you're going to see the glory and the deity of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, the church, the kahel, belongs to Jehovah, belongs to God. You will not find Israel as the congregation and assembly ever said to be the church of Gabriel, the church of the archangel Michael, the church of Joshua. It's always the church, the kahel Yehovah, kahel Elohim, kahel Il. The church of God, the church of Jehovah. And yet we get to the New Testament and it's now the church of Jesus Christ. Romans 16, 16. Romans 16, 16. Romans 16, 16. Salute one another with an holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. Wow. Paul. You know the Old Testament in Hebrew, Aramaic, and in Greek. You know the word ekklesia, and then here would be ekklesias, plural, would be the Greek word rendering kahel. You know kahel belongs to God. Why are you calling it the kahel of Mashiach, the congregations, the assemblies, the churches of Christ, especially when Christ is in heaven, and there's only one in heaven to whom the assembly belongs, to Jehovah. What are you saying about Jesus, Paul? Matthew 16, verse 18. Matthew 16, verse 18. You understand I just gave you another proof text for the deity of Christ? Matthew 16, 18. Jesus speaking. And I will say unto thee, right, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Jesus, it's your church. 
It's your ecclesia. It's your kahal. It's your kahal. Your ecclesia, your church. And now that you're in heaven, Paul could say the ecclesias, the churches, the kahal, the assembly, assemblies, plural, are the assemblies of Christ in heaven when Paul knows there is no other being in heaven that the assembly belongs to except God. Do you understand the implication of what I just showed you? Or it's not making sense? Yep, that's another one, Psalm. But Turb, I have to double check to see if the Greek renders it as ecclesia. Let me show that to you. Hold on. Let me double check. Okay. Folks, who's getting bored with this information? Is it blowing you away? All these nuggets, diamonds, gold, silver, truths that are in scriptures, proving its divine origin, it's from the true God, and that Jesus is God in the flesh, one with the Father and the Spirit. Let me see Psalm 82 real quickly. I want to see the Greek word. Because sometimes they use different Greek words. Yeah, let me see. See what the Greek word is for assembly. Oh, no, it's synagogue. See? Synagogue theon. There it uses the word synagogue. Turb, it's not ecclesia, ecclesia, it's synagogue, where we get the word synagogue. All right? Okay, do you understand what I just showed you? Two points again. Number one, church is not a New Testament teaching, a New Testament concept. It didn't come into existence with the coming of Christ. Church is a concept in the Old Testament. In fact, I want you to keep this in mind. What you have in the New Testament is not necessarily altogether brand new stuff. What you have in the New Testament is a more fuller, a more complete, a more perfect understanding, explanation of realities already mentioned in the Old Testament. If it's in the New Testament, take for granted it's also in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, it's now more fuller, more complete, and perfected. So church is not a New Testament teaching. It's an Old Testament teaching perfected, completed in Jesus Christ. Right? No, it didn't become visibly manifested AD. I don't think you've been listening to me. The church was manifested in the Old Testament. I just showed you it was manifested in the wilderness at the time of Moses during God descending on Mount Sinai, Acts 7.38. I don't think you were paying attention. You with me there? You understand what you just learned? Because this is going to prepare you for the shadows and realities, types and then prototypes, right? If there's something in the New Testament... Assume that concept, that teaching, that practice is already found in the Old Testament somewhere. And the New Testament is simply taking an Old Testament teaching concept or truth, building upon it, right? And giving us a more fuller, complete understanding and or <laughs> fulfillment. Freddie, come on, man. You're going to kill me. Freddie, if I retire from teaching, you'll be the reason. And I'm going to be a UPS man. There is more than one church in the world. You have the church in Rome. You have the church in Syria. You have the church in America. So they are churches. What's the confusion, man? Freddie, I'm up. Hold on, man. Let me. Where's the door, man? Guys, I'm going to hit myself against the wall. When I get knocked out, can you please call 911? Because I'll be knocked out and I'll probably die. By the way, Turbo already did it. It came with an Ethernet cable, and it's hooked up to the modem, which is why it's not buffering. Glory to God. Okay, can you send Repent out of here because he's not listening? Here's another guy pontificating and know-it-all who's speaking in his ignorance and stupidity. Bye-bye, Repent. Repent from your stupidity. You're not listening. It was manifested in the Old Testament in the wilderness. Allahu Akbar, these pontificators. Yeah. 
Focus now. Let's not be distracted. And may Jesus increase our knowledge, understanding, and our love and holiness, devotion, obedience to him, and bring more people to benefit. Did you learn this? I don't want to keep ranting so people get tired. Man, this guy's too much. Church is something in the Old Testament that's now perfected, completed in Christ. But this points to Jesus being God. So let me repeat the two points. Number one, church is not a New Testament teaching. It was already there in the Old Testament. Number two, the church in the Old Testament belonged to God alone because only God in heaven is the Lord of the church on earth. The church on earth, the ecclesia, the kahel, the assembly, belongs only to God in heaven, not to someone else. And yet the New Testament says that ecclesia, that kahel, that church belongs to Christ who is in heaven, which would be a contradiction with the Old Testament if Christ is not God. Do you see the point now? The only way the church on earth, the kahel on earth, the ecclesia on earth could belong to Christ who's in heaven is if Jesus is God in flesh, separate from the Father in person, but one with him in Holy Spirit in essence. Otherwise, this is idolatry. And the New Testament is contradicting the Old Testament. You understand what you just learned? You learned two important truths. Church is something already in the Old Testament. And the fact it's the church of Christ, the church of, churches of Christ, and Christ says, my church shows he has to be God in the flesh or we have a contradiction. You with me there? Thank you, Louisa. Your statement is gold. I'm having a hard time now understanding a basis for anti-Trinitarianism. Thank you. That's why it's an evil, wicked, blasphemous, satanic doctrine. How dare someone deny the Trinity when the Trinity is assumed all over the Bible? Even a blind man can say clearly God is a Trinity. They deserve the judgment and wrath that will fall upon them if they don't repent. So what about now, Cliff? Are you having a hard time with Christianity now? Or are you seeing the marvelous tapestry and beautiful harmony between Old and New Testaments? Okay, it's making sense now? So I'm preparing you for tomorrow's session, Lord willing. Tomorrow's session, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you how the Old Testament, the lives of Adam and Eve, of Abraham and Isaac, of Jacob, of Joseph, of Israel, of David, of Solomon, all point to Jesus, not just in the prophecies they uttered, but in the lives they lived and the events that took place in their life. Can I real quickly give you an example that I've given over and over again to people who've been following me? So please don't be bored. Those of you who've heard this, for the benefit of your brothers and sisters who are hearing this for the first time, I hope I'm not boring you. Let me give you a real quick, quick example. And Lord willing, we'll unpack it tomorrow because it's already over 90 minutes. And if I keep this going, no one's going to be watching. Okay, are you ready for an example how the lives of individuals point to Christ? Okay, you ready quickly? You ready? All right, here's an example. And folks, my usual time is going to be 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which is Canadian New York time, because that's a perfect time even for people in Europe, because in Europe it will be around 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. It's still not too late. So Lord willing. Now, let's take Joseph. Guys, pay attention. Joseph, the son of Jacob, betrayed by his brothers. Joseph, the son of Jacob, betrayed by his brothers. Joseph's father, his name is Jacob, right? But his name was changed to Israel. Genesis 32, 27 to 28. Pay attention, because if this doesn't blow you away, I'm going to give up. I'm going to stop teaching. I'm going to find where Freddy Rocco lives, and I'm going to live in his basement, and he's going to feed me, and he's going to pay my utilities. If this doesn't blow you away. Genesis 32, 27 and 28. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and has prevailed. So Jacob's name is Israel, right? Jacob's name is Israel and he has a son named Joseph. 
Now, how does God speak to Joseph, the son of Jacob, the son of Israel? Let's go to Genesis 37, 19. Genesis 37, 19. Genesis 37, 19. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Did you catch it? Joseph is a dreamer whom God speaks to in dreams and he interprets dreams. So how does God reveal his word to Joseph? In dreams, right? So Joseph, the son of Jacob, and God speaks to him in dreams. Joseph, the son of Jacob, and God speaks to him in dreams. Matthew 1, 16 and Matthew 1, 19 and 20. Matthew 1, 16 and Matthew 1, 19 and 20. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Jesus' adoptive father, his name is Joseph. Joseph's father is Jacob. Jacob has a son, Joseph. He's the adoptive father of Jesus. Matthew 1, 19 to 20. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately, meaning secretly. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Wait, 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 wait. Old Testament Joseph has a son. I'm sorry. Old Testament Jacob has a son named Joseph, and God speaks to him in dreams. New Testament, there's a Jacob who has a son named Joseph, the adoptive father of Jesus, and that Joseph, God speaks to him in dreams. Who didn't catch it? Who didn't catch that? Second connection. Second connection. Read Genesis carefully. Read Genesis carefully. Okay. A famine hits the land of Canaan. Joseph sends for his father Jacob, who's Israel, brings him into Egypt to save his life, to save him from dying due to famine. New Testament. Joseph takes Jesus, who's called Israel, in Isaiah 49, which I'll show you tomorrow, God willing. He takes baby Israel, one of Jesus' names, into Egypt to save his life. Okay, now, Old Testament Joseph becomes now a picture of Jesus. He was a picture of Joseph, Jesus' adoptive father, but now he becomes a picture of Jesus. Are you now ready to see how Joseph becomes a picture of Jesus? You ready? Joseph, hated by his brothers, handed over to the Gentiles for 20 pieces of silver, sold for silver, is taken by the Gentiles, he, he suffers and is persecuted even in prison. Then God exalts him to become second to Pharaoh, Lord over all the earth and the Savior of the world, saving the world from death by famine. Jesus, hated by his brothers, betrayed for silver, 30 pieces of silver, handed over the Gentiles who persecuted him, suffered at their hands, was even put to death, but exalted by God to be second to the Father, the Lord of the world, and the Savior of all the earth. You got it there or no? But now here's what's more amazing. Joseph's brothers did not recognize Joseph at the first coming, the first visitation. They recognized Joseph at the second coming, second visitation, where Joseph revealed who he is. They realized it was Joseph, and they fell before him in reverence. Acts 7, 12 to 13. Acts 7, 12 to 13. Acts 
Acts 7, 12 to 13, you little sinner. But when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent our fathers first. And at the second time, the second coming, Joseph was made known to his brethren. And Joseph's kindred was made known unto Pharaoh. It wasn't at the first coming where the nation Israel recognized their brother, the Messiah. It will be at the second coming, the second time, the second coming, Jesus' Jewish brothers will recognize who he is and then bow down and worship and mourning. Okay? So when I tell you, let me share it again. When I tell you, Everything in the Old Testament was miraculously, supernaturally designed by the Chime God, by the Holy Spirit, to be a picture of Jesus. Not just prophecies, but even the lives and the events of these major characters of the Bible. I was not exaggerating. Thank you, Medic for Christ. Let me repeat what he said. They weren't joking when they said, whole Bible is about Christ. Oh, and I forgot the final point, folks. Oh, and then I'm going to end it here. Okay, final point. Remember, Jesus is from the tribe of Judah. Okay, tribe of Judah. Let me blow you away with this, with this session, and then, Lord willing, tomorrow we'll do something on this. Remember, I said Jesus is a tribe of Judah, and as a Judean, he cannot be a priest in the earthly tabernacle because he's not from the tribe of Levi. He's not from the line of Aaron, right? So he could not be the high priest of the earthly temple because according to Old Testament, for him to be a priest there, he'd have to be from Levi and the line of Aaron, right? Instead, he comes from a better line, a superior line, the line of Melchizedek. He's a high priest like Melchizedek, right? Who is greater than Levi and his sons, correct? Do you guys want to be blown away now? Do you want to be blown away? Who was the forerunner of Jesus? that prepared the coming of Christ and announced to Israel, here is your Messiah, he's your God in the flesh. Who was that? John the Baptist, right? You guys want to get blown away? Okay, get ready to be blown away. Here. Luke 1, 5 tells us John's mother, Elizabeth, was a daughter, one of the daughters of Aaron. So she's from the line of Aaron. John the Baptist's father is a priest, Zechariah. He's from the line of Aaron, which is why Gabriel appeared to him while he was lighting up the candles in the temple. So that means John the Baptist is a bona fide priest, a bona fide priest from the line of Aaron. He is a Levite from the line of Aaron and a priest. Do you know why he was a priest from the line of Aaron? Because that was God's way of having an Aaronic priest, a priest from the line of Aaron, passing the baton to the true priest who's greater than him. So this Aaronic priest said, you are the one, my priesthood, the priesthood of the Old Testament was pointing to you. You are now here. We must fade into the background and decrease and you must increase. Here you go. I forgot to mention that yesterday. I forgot. You understand now? On top of that, guys, if you read, write down. I can't quote it now. Read from Exodus chapter 29 onwards. Start at Exodus 29 and read onwards. And then read numbers. Write these down. Exodus chapter 29 onwards. And then write down numbers chapter 4 verse 3. Let's look at numbers 4 3. Numbers chapter 4 verse 3. Numbers chapter 4. Verse 35 and Numbers 4, verse 43. Numbers chapter 4, verse 3, 35 and 43. Watch this. Guys, watch here. Let me blow you away. No, this way. Man, come on, man. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what articles, Elizabeth. I'm so tired and drained. I even forgot what articles I was going to give you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hebrews and Melchizedek. Okay. Guys, read with me. From 30, year old, 30 years old and upward, even until 50 years old, all they that enter into the host to do the work of the tabernacle of the congregation. To serve in the temple, tabernacle, you have to be 30 years of age and older. Numbers 435. From 30 years old and upward, even unto 50 years old, everyone that entereth into the service, priestly service, for the work in the tabernacle of the congregation. 
from 30 years old and upward, even unto 50 years old, even everyone that entereth into the service for the work in the tabernacle of the congregation. Notice, to be a priest serving in the temple and to perform priestly functions, you have to be at least 30 years old. Guys, pay attention. 30 years old. Now, if you start reading from Exodus 29 onwards, Aaron and his sons, in order to assume their role as priests, had to be washed in water, washed in water, and had oil poured out on them to anoint them. They are anointed by oil and washed in water, and they had to be at least 30 and upward. Jesus, Luke 3, 21 to 23, washed in the water of Jordan and was 30 years old when this Levitical priest passes on the baton and prepares him for his priestly work. Luke 3, 21 to 30, 23. Luke 3, 21 to 23. Now, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was open and the Holy Ghost descended in the bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, which said, Thou art my beloved son, and thee I am well pleased. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. Coincidence? John the Baptist, a high priest from the line of Aaron, from the tribe of Levi, washes Jesus in the Jordan River. He's then anointed by the Spirit at the age of 30 because John the Baptist is now preparing him for his high priestly ministry. And he says, I pass the baton. You increase and we all decrease. We fade now. It's all about you. You get it now? Honestly, who's not blown away by the depth, the beauty, the meat, the majesty of the Holy Bible? The Bible itself is proof that the God of the Bible is real. He's alive. And Jesus is the Lord of glory. He truly lives. No, Johnny, I can't. Go back and listen. If you came in late, don't ask me to explain again. If you've been here from the beginning. It's a different story. You just came in. Right? Folks, let me tell you this. Those of you who have eyes to see and ears to hear and have been given this blessing to know the scriptures with this depth where you have no doubt that the Bible is supernatural, it is from God, and the God of the Bible is real, if after this you turn away and reject Jesus or fail to live for him, you deserve the judgment that will fall upon you when you stand before King Jesus. You are left with no excuse. And definitely me. I deserve hell and the most severest form of punishment if I turn away from Jesus. May it never be that we turn away from Jesus. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. And Jesus Christ, you are Jehovah Almighty in the flesh. One with the Father, your Father, and the Spirit. Not one person, but one God and three persons. And we pray you come sooner than later. Lord Jesus, wash us and seal us and cover us by your holy blood. And my daughters, wash them, cleanse them, and seal them by your blood. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Give us the power to live for you and obey you truly when no one's watching. To be pure and holy and in love with you. And help us to know this word. To plumb the depths of your word. And to live it out by the power of your spirit for your glory. Because we cannot love you enough. And we want to love you more. We love you, Jesus. Give us the help we need to serve you. The holiness to delight your heart. And provide our daily bread. Especially for my daughters, Lord God. And fight my battles. And keep me free to serve you. We need you, Jesus. We love you. And we thank you for being in love with us. We cannot live without you. You are the Father's heart. His beloved. His son who became flesh, and we thank you, and we love you, Son of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let me give you the articles before you leave. Hold on. Almost left. Guys, can you really pray for me? And I'll tell you why. Remember, I'm a human being. Human being. Carnal flesh. Sinful desire. Sinful inclination. Who struggles. Who gets tired. Who's getting old. Like right now, I'm very tired, very tired. I'm fatigued. And because of the stress of these demonic attacks, I, I feel it in my neck, in my head, and lonely without my daughters. Can you pray that Jesus, in his love for me and his grace I don't deserve, 
will do miracles for me and my daughters, especially my daughters who need their father, will give me the health to serve him as long as he wants me to serve him and provide our daily needs and save me from my own flesh and keep me alert, rejuvenated, regenerated, replenished, so that the Spirit will continue to fill me so I can pour out into your lives. Because the more the Spirit fills me, the more I pour out into your lives. Because we're being filled, not to keep it in, but to pour it out to fill others by the power of the Holy Spirit. So partner with me to pray for me, covenant with me to pray for me and fast for me and my daughters for protection, for deliverance, for provision, for the health and the holiness I need. I really do because I am tired, guys. Right now my voice feels tired, my neck because of stress. But he's a good God. He's a beautiful God. So let me get you these articles. You got to study them, folks. Study them, download them, use them in your churches and your Bible studies. Here's article one, exegesis of Hebrews one, chapter one. There it goes. Save that link. Click on it. Save it. Now, the article on Melchizedek. Melchizedek. And by the way, don't just read those articles. Go to that website, answeringislam.net. I think I have about 200 articles. Over 90% is on Christianity, the Trinity, the deity of Christ, dealing with tough objections and contradictions and the Bible's authority and the whole, all of it. It's there. Here's the article on Melchizedek. Doesn't the Bible show that Melchizedek is a divine being? No, it doesn't. Okay, here it is. Save those two articles. And the final one, this one is on showing the Quran is a lie from the devil. Muhammad is a son of Satan, an antichrist, under the feet of Jesus, who's burning in hell for deceiving people. May Jesus set Muslims free. Here's the article for you guys. This one shows that the Quran that Muslims recite today, the Quran that the Muslims recite today, was transmitted by a man named Hafs. And Muslim scholars say that this man named Hafs was a liar, unreliable, untrustworthy, who stole people's books, who plagiarized people's books, which is why the scholars would narrate from him. And yet the Quran recited by the majority of Muslims is the Quran that this man passed on. So their very Quran was passed on by a liar, a cheat, a scoundrel, a thief, according to Muslim scholars. And this is Islam. Here you go. Here's this article. Lord willing, see it tomorrow. Thank you, theistic, leaning, agnostic. I don't know why you're agnostic. You seem to be in love with Jesus, and you seem to see that the Bible is the word of God, and Jesus is Lord. Change it. Theistic, loving Jesus. Right? Meaning you're a theist who loves Jesus. And thank you for that praise. Lord bless you and bring you to his feet and preserve us. Guys, remember, Christ is alive. He is risen. He does love us. And because he lives, we don't have to fear death. And he will come physically to the earth. There'll be no more pain, no more suffering, no more death, no more evil, no more Satan. Perfection, perfect beauty, love, and peace in his presence forever. And again, he's in love with you. He's in love with me. Let's pray that we fall in love with him. We love you, Lord Jesus. Lord willing, see you tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, God willing. Take care. Christ is risen, risen indeed.